to Cinema Talk, where I talk to important and cool people in the film industry. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and today I got a really cool guest I'm talking with. Uh, man, he is just, he's been all over the place. He was a film critic. He was on Spill.com. He is a screenwriter. Oh my God, I'm so excited to talk to him. It's C. Roberts Cargill. Hi. Thanks for coming on and talk to me. Oh, thanks for having me, man. So it's, uh, God, I just, I, I love your work. Like, it's just, and then knowing that you love 80s movies, I mean, because you got the junk food cinema podcast, it's just amazing stuff, man. Oh, thank you. So my first question that I always ask is, uh, what is your earliest memory when it comes to movies? Uh, my earliest memory is when I was four years old. Um, I, uh was uh, at a movie theater seeing Star Wars at uh, the 79 Repertory uh, re-release. And um, uh, I, I, my dad was in the military, so uh, uh, every Air Force base had a uh, its own single-screen theater on it, and they would have prints that they would just send around to all the bases. And so a lot of them, the really popular movies, would just loop around over and over again. So things like Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back uh, and E.T. were um, in circulation for years uh, being shown. Uh, so I could just go to the movie theater and see stuff all the time. And my parents would take me, but because it was an Air Force base, because it was very safe, because every theater had a security police officer stationed at it, my parents always felt that it was okay from a very young age to just drop me off at the movie theater. So as young as like five and six, my mom would leave me at the movie theater and go shopping and I would watch something like, you know, Rats and Nim or um, uh, uh, Fox and the Hound was one she left me at at one point. Um, But yeah, they took me to see Star Wars and my first memory is of the scene where Luke is standing out on Tatooine and he's looking and he's seeing the two setting suns and I remember being four years old thinking, oh, that's no fair. He gets two of them. Uh, I only get one. And um, and it's a really silly, stupid four-year-old memory to have. But that's that's my earliest uh, my earliest memory, um, uh, period. Uh, that's the, the earliest that I remember. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, so what was the movie that got you into movies? Like, do you want to know the behind the scenes, you know, to get into, like, possible, you know, movies? I don't know. Um, I really don't know what it was that triggered that. Um, I don't remember one. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I watched this movie and, and the effects were so cool. I wanted to know about you know the effects work um, and how that worked. There was no moment like that for me. The, only, the closest I have is um, I remember uh, I, I would read movie reviews regularly and watch movie reviews. In fact, I remember very much uh, uh, the night that Siskel and Ebert um, we're reviewing Return of the Jedi because it was going to be my very first look at any scenes from Return of the Jedi. I was so excited. Um, uh, but uh, I remember that there was a review for uh, um, uh, Return of the Living Dead Part 2. And uh, I was reading that in the newspaper because I, exci- I was excited about that. I had just gotten into horror movies. And while reading it, I had that realization where I was like, wait a second this person who wrote this review, they get paid to do this. Like there's somebody that gets paid to go and watch movies and then write about them. Like I like writing um, and I love movies. I want to do that someday. And that was the first time that I ever wanted to be a film critic. Uh, And so that was, it was some review in the, you know, uh, the, I think it was the Tucson daily news um, that uh, was reviewing return of the living dead part two. That's the first time I had that. Uh, but yeah, there was no real movie that made me want to learn about the behind the scenes. I just it was something that was really starting to be popular in the late '80s. I remember they had a, um, a news station uh, on the uh, um, I can't remember was it the Movie Channel? It was it wasn't it had some like very generic name, but it was something that was on probably existed for like six months to a year on cable stations where literally all they ran all day was EPKs. Um, and so all day it was just trailers for movies and behind the scenes of movies uh, coming out. And I remember when that was on our cable system and I watched that repeatedly for an entire summer. 
Um, so I was learning about all these movies coming out and was really excited about them. Um, so that was the, probably the first time I was really heavily exposed to the behind the scenes of it. Okay. 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 That's good. Um, so of course you got into writing, of course, uh, eventually down the line. Uh, so, you know, you went to, uh, let's see, Gorilla Films website to write reviews. It was, I think the first one you wrote was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon in 2000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was literally, I was hanging out in the AICN chat room and a guy who was running GorillaFilm.com uh, was like, oh, hey, I need to, I need to get a review up of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. People have been seeing it. And I was like, oh yeah, I've seen that twice. Uh, and hadn't come out yet, but uh, there was a Harry had had a screening here in town, and the screening had sold out, and they had um, given away too many tickets. So in order, order to solve that, they decided to show the movie immediately again, uh, right after, also for free. And as long as you had a ticket for this movie, you could get into the next one. And I loved the movie so much, I turned right around and said, "Fuck this! I'm going to see this movie again." And um, so I watched it twice in a row. And so when uh, Angus uh, asked me. Uh, uh, was saying, oh, I need somebody to review it. I'm like, well, I could review it for you. And he, oh, dude, would you? That'd be great. So I wrote a review of the uh, the movie, and he posted it, and it got 50,000 hits in the first day, um, which is, you know, the most traffic that website had gotten at that point. And uh, so they were super excited. They're like, dude, do you want to come write for us? And I was like, yeah, of course I would. And from that point on, I started writing reviews, and people saw that I could write, and that's where I got asked to join in at Cool News, and eventually... I ended up with Corey Coleman and Martin Thomas and Chris Cox over at The Real Deal as a uh, cable access show. And that, uh, you know, Corey was working on animated stuff at the time. And I was like, hey, dude, you know what you should be doing? You should animate us. And we should we should have an animated movie review show. And he's like, that's not it's not physically possible. It's you, you can't hand draw that much animation. I'm like, no, no, no. You just do elements and. And you only need about 30 seconds of animation for a movie review because you open up with the animation, you close the animation, you pepper the animation in over the trailer like we do when we when we do our review uh, for the the, the um, for the cable access show. And he played around with it. He said, holy shit, this works. He's like, yeah, we can do this. And so we started the Real Deal uh, uh, animated movie review site, which then got picked up uh, very shortly after by a, an ad company and was rebranded as Spill, and then we were Spill.com, and um, and so yeah. Oh, because everybody knows Spill. Because oh my god, that was huge. I even watched Spill. My god, that was my go-to <laughs> thing to watch anything Spill. I was like, oh, so good stuff. Uh, so so eventually down the line, you kind of part away from film criticism and go into like become an actual writer like a novelist and actually screenwriting so what is the process of screenwriting because there's a lot of people out there who are trying to write their own scripts and they want to you know maybe tips they want to a good tip of how to make a good screenplay uh well geez there's there, there's a lot of, they teach courses on it um i guess the the biggest thing for me i mean the process of screenwriting is very much about just getting it on paper and then rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it until it works. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, screenwriting is very lean. Uh, there's not a lot of room for fat. People don't, you know, when they watch a movie, they don't want to, they don't want downtime. They want everything to move. They don't want slow scenes. So you've got to, you've got to hone that down uh, and make it really sharp. Uh, and, uh, and you only have so much real estate to do that in. So um, it's very much about, you know, just kind of dumping all the words onto the page and then slowly chipping away and uh, just sanding it down to, you know, a nice lean story that people sit down and read and go, shit, I want to make this movie. Um, the biggest suge suggestion I can make to anyone who wants to be a screenwriter is, is this. Um, character, uh, a lot of people think that a character is a collection of back history and likes and dislikes um you know uh my character was raised as a slave and and uh then fought in the, the slave pits and and then you know eventually broke his chains and went out into the world and became a barbarian and it's like that's not that's not what a character is uh, a character is choice um and if there's anything to keep in mind it's the choices a character makes 
uh, their back history is only important if it informs a choice that they make, like they make a choice counter to who they are. You know, this is why you have so many um, uh, one last job crime movies where you know that this guy's been a bad person, but they want to get away from it and they don't want to do it anymore. Uh, but they're forced into one last job and we just got to do this job and then I can get out. Uh, and the making the choice to do that one last job is what makes that character an interesting character. It doesn't matter really that they've been a bad guy or a terrible guy for 20, 30, 40 years. It's about the choice they make in the moment that the audience is watching it. And as a screenwriter, your job is to give us a character that's, uh, or characters that are going to make interesting choices that make us want to follow along on those choices they make. And that if you think about character from that way, like you sit down and write a character and go, what choices does character make? He'll end up writing great stories. You know, a lot of the times story movies that people don't like and they can't identify why they don't like it more often than not, it's because the character never actually chooses to do anything. You know, he's a police officer and he's chasing a criminal and uh, the criminal's doing bad stuff. So he's got to stop him. And at no point along the way does that, police officer are they given a choice where they have to make a hard choice where we're going to be interested in that choice they make they always do exactly what we expect them to and that's boring boring storytelling so the, the the biggest thing that i would recommend is always make sure that you ask yourself what is this character deciding to do and is it something that the audience expects them to do or is it something that makes this story worth telling and uh, and so that that's the big recommendation that I can make. That's so true. I mean, I actually took a screenwriting class in college, and just it is hard work. Like it's hard to come up with like character and then dialogue and action. Just like it's it took me I didn't even finish the screenplay, but it just took me a long time to actually do it for the class. Just like oh. I can see why these screenwriters are so good at it, and they, they're very creative with their minds like that, which I can understand pretty much. Uh, this is good stuff, because you end up coming up with uh, writing Sinister. Yeah. With, with your friend, um, Scott Derrickson. Yep. That's, I've, like... God, those movies are just, I, I'm not a huge fan of horror, like, I've, but I've seen people loving the shit out of it, because it's just really good stuff, from what I've been told, so, how did that go about co-writing with him, with, uh, Sinister? Well, it's, it was an idea I came up with when I was a critic, uh, actually, it was just an idea that I thought would make a great movie. Um, it, it all came from a nightmare I had. I, I had watched The Ring. I had been up working late because I was working at a video store and writing. And I'd been up for like 23 hours. And me and my wife had some time and she wanted to see a movie. And it's like, oh, there's that Ring movie. Let's go see that. We can fit it in now. And we went and saw The Ring and we loved it. And I was exhausted. I'm like, look, I'm just going to take an hour and a half power nap and then get up and, and get some work done. And in that hour and a half, I had this nightmare about going into my attic and finding a box of eight millimeter films, Super 8 films, and um, spooling one up. And then it's the opening shot of Sinister. Um, you know, it's this family hanging from the tree. And that just, that image stuck with me and it stuck with me for several weeks. Like I couldn't shake that dream. And eventually I was like, there's a story here. Like there's a, there's a movie in this somewhere. And so I just played around with it for a while. And then eventually it had solidified into a, 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 a movie that I could pitch. And so uh, I ended up in Vegas, of all things, um, with uh, uh, my wife and some friends. And uh, Scott Derrickson was there at the same time. And we were already friends and interacting online. And uh, when he saw on Twitter that I was uh, uh, in Vegas, he's like, hey, man, we should get together and have a drink. So I'm like, great. Awesome. So we go to the Mandalay Bay and uh, we're sitting in the bar and we're five, I'm five white Russians in. And he says, hey, can I get your professional opinion on this idea that I'm pitching around uh, and see what you think? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So he bounced this idea off me and then I gave him my notes and I said, well, hey, let me, I've got this movie that's been bouncing around in my head for a long time. Can I, uh, um, uh, can I bounce it off you and get your professional opinion? He goes, all right, all right. Everybody pitches me at least once. Here's your chance pitch me 
and I pitched him Sinister, and he said, holy fuck, I want to make that movie. He's like, that's... I know exactly who wants to make that movie. I've got two guys who want to give me, you know, um, X amount of money to make a movie. All I need to do is have a good pitch, and that's exactly the pitch they're looking for. Um, he goes, so what I want you to do is I want you to go home. When you get home from Vegas... I want you to write a three to five page treatment. I want you to register it with the WGA and then I'll take it around and we'll get it sold. And I'm like, okay, great. That's awesome. So the next day he's actually playing cards. It's the whole reason he was in uh, Vegas was for a tournament with his brother and he's playing cards at my, uh, at my hotel. So I walk past him like, Oh, Hey, it's Scott. And so I swing by and go, Hey dude, what's up? He goes, Oh, Hey, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm out of this hand, but I'm jumping in on the next hand. But, uh, I w don't forget. I want you to go home and write a three to five page treatment. Register with the WGA, and uh, then uh, I'll take it out next week. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, so, um, so uh, I end up, uh, I go home the next day, and uh, I'm in bed, and I'm wiped, and I'm asleep for like 20 minutes, and then the phone rings, and my wife comes in, and she goes, it's Scott. And I'm like, all right, I'll take it. And he goes, hey, man, I know you're probably Vegas, but I just wanted to remind you, I'm going to write a three to five page treatment, register it with the WGA, and then I'll take it out next week. And by that time, I was like, this dude's serious. Like, this guy ser is very serious about this. All right, you know what? I'll do it. So I slept, and then when I woke up, I wrote a five page treatment. And um, uh, and he was like, dude, this is this is it. And he took it out uh, that, uh, that week. And we had two uh, companies interested in it. One of them was Blumhouse. And then I happened to be out in L.A. the very next week for uh, a, a movie event. And so we used that as an excuse to sit down with the producers, and I ended up sitting down with Jason Blum, and he wanted to make it, and so we decided to make it. And uh, so Scott uh, was like, look, ordinarily I would pay you $50,000 to option this story, and then I'd write the script, but I just lost my writing partner, so do you want to write this with me, and then we can write the idea that I had, and after those two scripts we can figure out if we want to still work together. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. That'd be a lot of fun. And uh, uh, two weeks into writing, um, he uh, was like, dude, uh, I've never had an experience like this before. Will you just be my writing partner? And I was like, yeah, I'm having a great time. So our, method, our, our methodology really works because I am a night owl, uh, as you and I talked about uh, yeah. in emails. I, I go to bed at about 7 in the morning, um, which is about 5 in the morning L.A. time. So I'm up all night writing, and then I pass pages off to Scott, and then he... He's a family man. You know, he wakes up in the morning, he makes breakfast for his kids, he gets his kids off to school, he sits down at 9 o'clock with his coffee in front of his computer, and he starts to work. So he sits down at about 9 and starts writing. And so he writes all day, and then when he's done is about when I'm waking up, so he sends me pages. If we need to talk about it, we talk back and forth. Um, and, then, uh, 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 and then I write through the night. And so we're constantly generating pages, so we work very quickly. Um, and we, you know, we essentially are writing in half the time that, uh, other teams write in. Cause a lot of teams sit down in the same room, uh, or work during the same hours and pass stuff back and forth. We're always working. So, uh, we get stuff done quickly and, uh, uh, and it's a lot of fun doing it. Um, I really enjoy working with him. He's a genius and, uh, he's just a fun guy and he's a brilliant guy. And, um, uh, and we have a lot of the same opinions on film. Uh, but we also have very different um, obsessions in film. Like he is very much obsessed with the great directors and films. He, he taught a course on Kurosawa. Um, uh, and uh, me, I love, like you, I love 80s movies. I love junk food films. I love the type of things that a lot of people discard. I'm constantly at in the middle of the night when I'm not working, I pour myself a glass of whiskey and I sip through Shudder and try to find some obscure 80s horror movie that I've never seen before. Um, so, uh, uh, and and so I draw upon that. And so I'm drawing from like, you know, a lot of the B films and B cinema and he's drawing from obscure A cinema and uh, together we kind of bring that together and try to add those aesthetics into filmmaking. And uh, and so far people have enjoyed the, the, the movies we've made. Yeah, that's like a good combination, just like a yin yang kind of feeling there. Um, so how did you come with the idea for Sinister 2 then?
chat it again. I have really fuzzy internet, so if you're noticing that, I have really fuzzy internet here, so. Yeah, uh, that's what I was just, no, you started uh, uh, for a second in there, and so I was like, oh no, am I losing him? And, and it came back, so yeah. Yeah, sorry, so this might be a, a continuing thing throughout this whole thing. I might just edit all this shit up, but eventually, so. Um, that's okay, no, please do, by all means. That's good, so I just, um, yeah, so that's kind of like a yin-yang kind of feeling with you two working together. It's really good stuff, actually. Um, so how did you come up with Sinister 2, then? Uh, well, Sinister 2 was really one of those things where while we were shooting Sinister, um, uh, I was in the tent having lunch, and Jason Blum sits down beside me and goes, you know you're going to have to start thinking about S2, right? And I'm like, what's S2? And he goes, Sinister 2. Like, this is, people are going to dig this, and they're going to want to see I was like, uh, oh, I kind of wrote this to be a one one and done. He goes, yeah, but uh, we don't do that. Uh, and uh, so he was, uh, uh, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, well, all right, well, um, I'll think something up. But I had no ideas for it. And so it was really something that me and Scott just kind of bounced around ideas for a couple of years until we came up with the idea of something I always just wanted to play around with, which was um, uh, Twins. Uh, my wife is a twin, and um, uh, twins have very interesting dynamics that um, a lot of people aren't really accustomed to. Um, you know, there's there's really two different basic types of the interactions, the way uh, twins can interact. And one is there's the one that everyone's familiar with, which we walk alike, we talk alike, we dress alike, we're best friends. And then there's the other dynamic, which is you have two people who are identical who are very much trying to be their own person. And so um, you see the different ways they reject that. And generally you get a dominant twin and a submissive twin, one that just kind of goes along with it and just kind of decides, well, I'll just go off and be myself. And the other twin who's like, no, I'm going to make a big deal about this. And I am absolutely not the same person as you. And I have to be uh, 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 on my own. And uh, I always been fascinated with trying to tell a story about that uh, dynamic. Cause that's how, my wife and her sister are is, you know, they're, they, you know, they, they didn't always get along. They, uh, um, constantly struggled with people seeing them as one whole as, uh, uh, instead of two people. And so I was like, well, what if, what would happen if, a, you know, twins somehow came upon, um, the box and what would happen if they, uh, um, uh, if, uh, Bagul played upon that and how would Bagul, play those two twins against one another. And, um, and ultimately, you know, the, what I came with is what Bagul would do is would choose the submissive twin and then force the dominant twin to eventually, um, uh, uh demand to be taken seriously by Bagul. Um, and that that's what would flip that kid. Uh, and, uh, so that was, that was the idea that we played with. And then, uh, we worked on the script. We had a very short time to get that script off the ground, uh, unfortunately, because Scott, um, had just finished up a film and was in the middle of editing. Um, and, uh, uh, so he was not, uh, available until a very short window of time. And then of course, everybody knew that we wrote quickly. So they're like, Oh, we'll be fine. And so we had a very narrow window to write that script. And then of course we had, you know, once we had the script, we had, a, we got a director attached and then the director went in different directions and the film is what it is now. Um, but it was a, it was a very weird process for that one. It wasn't like anything else we've ever written. So when you were, when you write the screenplay, do the writers, Actually, I was always I curious about this. Do the writers like stick to the production of the film or do the writers just say, here's my screenplay, make a movie out of it and just go with it? Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on whether you are attached as a producer, um, whether they keep you around for it uh, or not. You know, some producers and directors see screenwriters as disposable uh, and that you're just a gun for hire. And if, if you're not doing what we want or accomplishing what we want, we'll get somebody else. Um, and a lot of Hollywood operates that way. Other, other producers, um, and directors are very much like, no, this, 
the writer is as much the creative force on this film as a director is, and we need to keep them around for that voice that we hired them for to begin with. Uh, and uh, so, since we were since uh, Scott was a producer on both the the films, uh, we were definitely still around. And of course, since we'd worked on it um, and we're doing polishes and such, and since we were making back end, the deal they had with us is they had us around to do some writing. Um, uh, for dirt cheap, so it would have cost a lot more to bring in another writer to come in and do any other writing. So why replace us? Um, so that is, uh, so that's. But you know, when you work on something like a Marvel film, Marvel brings in multiple writers uh, over the course of any given project. It's very rare that they have, you know, one writing team that stays the whole way through. Even even the people they have the best relationships with, they bring someone in to polish up or punch up certain scenes. Um, in those films uh, as well, so uh, because they they also they don't do, Marvel doesn't see writers specifically as disposable as much as they see the value in having multiple writers and what multiple writers can bring to a project. So um, they'll you know like on Doctor Strange they brought in uh, 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 one set of writers just to do some jokes and to add some extra punch up to the movie. Uh, and brought in another writer to come in and do a quick polish uh, on two specific scenes that they wanted a female voice to. So, um, and some of that stuff stayed, and most of that stuff went. But uh, but they bring it around to try it out, and so you'll have that happen sometimes where they'll keep around writers like they did with us, uh, but then bring in interim writers just to do quick little things. But yeah, sometimes you will just, you'll be signed on to a project and then they'll be, yeah, no, you didn't do what we wanted. Sayonara. Uh, we'll see you next time. We'll call you if we have something for you. Uh, but then other times you stick around for the long haul. That's good to know. That's really good to know. I will get to Dr. Strange in a second, but, uh, I know it's only been like two years since Sinister 2 came out, but are you guys like, have you guys talked about like Sinister 3 at some point? Any ideas popping around Sinister 3? I'm not. I'm not super interested in Sinister Three. Um, I, I I think one of the problems we ran into on Sinister Two was um, it was a uh, uh, it was a movie that was best done in one. There are people that really like the second film, um, but I feel like we any last ideas we had to play around with kind of got burnt out in that in terms of film wise. So I don't. I I'm personally not too interested in a three. Um, so I haven't been kicking her around or talking about it. Okay. Uh, and nobody's called me up and said, Hey, Sinister three, can we make it? So, uh, I don't anticipate there being one, but I won't say never because you know, it's Hollywood. You, you never right. know when somebody is going to come along and, you know, some, some hot young horror screenwriter says, Oh dude, I've always wanted to write a sinister movie and here's my sinister movie. And Jason Blum goes, Oh my God, that's great. Let me call Cargill and Scott and see if they'll say yes. Um, so you never know, but as of right now, I'm, I'm certainly not, um, uh, coming up with anything for it. Okay. Let's put that in history. People, this is people can look back. It's like, yeah, not now, but maybe in the future. Um, so, all right. How did you two get into Marvel and Dr. Strange? That's the story I want to hear. Okay. So Marvel, uh, does this really interesting thing, um, when they uh, bring on talent for whenever they're, whenever they're doing movies, what they do is they go out to Kevin Feige does a thing that's very similar to, um, uh, uh, to what Jason Blum does. It's one of the things I love about both these guys. And while I, I'll continue to work with these guys as long as I can is they like, they're the type of talent scouts that go to the minor leagues or go to a major league team and look who's on the bench and say, you know, that guy's really great. And with the right team, that guy could do something just as good as everyone else on this team, but he's not getting any play time because he's benched behind all these, you know, bigger names. So um, what they do is, you know, uh, uh, what Jason does is Jason goes to guys who are really talented, but who Hollywood shit on who, you know, Hollywood run, ran through the uh, uh, the machine, shoot up and spit out. And now nobody's really, you know, people will take meetings with them because they've done some great stuff. But um, 
but nobody believes in them, thinks that they probably have used up what talent they have. You uh, you know, when he did that with both Scott and James Wan, where, you know, James Wan had made a couple of, he made Saw, and that was huge, and then he made a couple other movies that didn't do well. Uh, I think Dead Silence is the name of one of them. Um, and the other was uh, um, uh, oh, the <sighs> Vigilante movie he did uh, that I love, and I'm blanking on the title of now. Um uh, Kevin Bacon movie. Uh, anyhow, um, he, uh, uh, you know, he goes and he, J- Jason plucks those guys up. Well, what um, Kevin Feige does is he gets the guys who, uh, who like have just come up from uh, been brought up by someone like Jason Blum or has just done really well on the indie or small time circuit or has done something interesting. You look at, um, uh, the Rousseau brothers and the Rousseau brothers made a failed film back in the early aughts uh, called welcome to Collinwood and their Hollywood career was pretty much over and they went into TV and they did a couple of great episodes of uh, community and everybody's like, Oh, Hey, these guys are doing fantastic. And so Feige's like, I want to take a meeting with them. And, you know, uh, sinister did really well. So, you know, uh, Feige was like, I want to meet with this guy. Um, and uh, uh, and what he does is he brings in all of these this these great talented up and comers, and then says, "Tell me what a Doctor Strange movie is." And so he wants to know what you think that superhero movie looks like. Uh, and so they do a couple of exploratory meetings beforehand, um, and then they eventually get to the okay, pitch us your version of this movie. And so they go through and they you know do bring in 10 to 20 uh, men and women for um, uh, for each film at first, and then they whittle that down to about a dozen, 10 or a dozen, and then they start doing serious meetings with them, and then they get it down to about three to five people, and then say, bring us a pitch. And so um, Scott and I worked up a pitch, and so we started talking about what is it, what is a Doctor Strange movie? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What, uh, what are the elements that, that you know, will make this, you know, uh, a Doctor Strange movie? And so we, we did that, and we wrote um, a 15-page uh, mini script of, like, here's what we think a Doctor Strange movie looks like. And Scott then commissioned some artists to come in and do some artwork, and he made a 20-minute presentation, and he stood up and he did the presentation, um, complete with artwork and then, you know, running through the, the 15 page script. And, uh, uh, that was that 15 page script is what got us the job. There was one particular scene in that, uh, uh, in that script that, uh, that we wrote, um, that Kevin Feige and, uh, uh the other producer, Stephen Broussard were just like, that's a Dr. Strange moment. That's what a Doctor Strange movie looks like. This is this this scene is our trailer moment. It is Doctor Strange. Oddly enough, didn't appear in any of the trailers. Um, they for for like two years they kept saying this is going to be in the trailer. This scene right here, this is going to be in the trailer. They kept it played it close to the vest, and they're like, you know what? No, this will work better if we just let audiences be like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, and of course, that's the scene um, uh, that stayed pretty intact from the original version which is like write down a dialogue, which is um, when Dr. Strange is, is being operated on by Christine and he has the battle in astral form in the ER. Um, but that's, they, they read that scene and they said, that's it. That's what a Dr. Strange movie is. That's great. And so that's the scene that got us the job. Uh, and of course that then stuck around uh, all the way through and now is one of the centerpieces of that film. How much of the script was yours between you and Scott? Like, I know you said the other eyes come in direct other stuff, but how much of the script was intact throughout the whole movie? Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere around two thirds of the script because John Spates did the first draft because they they wanted to hire us to write it, but uh, they were on such a tight timeline that they're like. Scott's not going to be able to work pre-production on this movie and write the script. Like, so, but at least we have him overseeing the script. So we'll have all those great ideas. And so they brought in John Spates to write the script. Um, and during that interim, 
um, the actor that they were in talks with to to play the part dropped out, and then they ended up signing Benedict Cumberbatch. But in order to get Benedict Cumberbatch, he was locked into Hamlet until um, uh, the end of October of 2015. So he was gonna he wasn't available. So they were like, all right, we're gonna have to push this back six months. It was supposed to release in July, uh, last July, but it ended up getting pushed to November. Um, so uh, that was um, the uh, just the way it, it fell. But once they had more time, then they're like, okay, we can bring Cargill in and uh, Cargill and Scott can then work on the script. And so we worked on the script from, from there on. But we kept a lot of what Scott had developed with uh, uh, John Spates and that John Spates had, had written. Um, and then John Spates came in at the very end and did. they brought him back to do a quick polish again. And um, he ended up doing a quick polish, and uh, that uh, uh, all together, um, uh, he we felt when we looked at it and broke it down, we were like, yeah, John Spates deserves credit on this, and so we shared we uh, we lobbied for it, and we all shared credit. So, uh, but I think it comes out to about two thirds of the script is me and Scott's. So going into that, how much did you know about Doctor Strange? Anything else? Oh, uh a lot. I was I was already a huge Doctor Strange fan. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I actually daydreamed about writing a Doctor Strange movie and uh, was like, that's never going to happen. Nobody's ever going to let me play with Doctor Strange. Um, and nobody's really going to ever make a Doctor Strange movie. Um, and so, like, when they first announced that there was a script uh, for a Doctor Strange movie, I was excited. I was like, oh, they're actually going to make one. And then when, you know, um, uh, and that script ended up getting thrown out. Like, that script was never used. Um, they started from scratch. Um, then, uh, when, uh, Winter Soldier, uh, when I was watching Winter Soldier and, uh, there's that scene where it, he gets, uh, uh, they mentioned Stephen Strange. I literally in my chair, I was just like, they're making a Doctor Strange movie. Oh my God, they're making a Doctor Strange movie. And my wife was like, why are you so excited? I'm like, they're, they mentioned Doctor Strange. They're going to make a Doctor Strange movie. That's so freaking cool. And so, uh, so I was so, uh, completely completely thoroughly unaware never even imagining for a second that i would be the guy writing it like it never even crossed my mind at that point i was just excited that i was gonna get to see it so then when scott calls me up one night and says hey cargill uh somebody's talking to us about a superhero movie i'm like dude scott seriously what superhero are we right for honestly and he goes dr strange and i'm like fuck that's the one that's per yes yes we yes Doctor Strange is so what we are right for and what we love. Oh my God, yes! And he's like, "So you want me to say yes to the medium?" I'm like, yes, say yes, yes. Let's do this. So yeah, it was that was how it all came to be. Um, so yeah, there was lots of geeking out. I was very familiar with the material going up, um, and uh, and so of course there was lots of. And then of course it you know once once uh, uh, we were doing the the pre-production work for it, I picked up all of the, the collections um, that collected the entire runs and just sat down for three months. And every day I'd read several Dr. Strange issues. So by the time it came time to sit down and write that, um, write that treatment, I had mainlined nearly 50 years of Dr. Strange over the course of three months. So uh, uh, I was very familiar by that point. Have you seen the Doctor Strange, like, from 1978, I believe, TV pilot? Yeah, CBS, yeah. I've, I have I have not only seen every iteration of Doctor Strange, whether it be stuff like that or the knockoff movie Doctor Mordred from 1992 that Charles Band did, uh, I've also read every major draft of the script starting in 1982 when Lawrence Block wrote a... a um, uh, a treatment to Larry Cohen. Speaking of 80s movies, uh, the 80s movie director extraordinaire Larry Cohen of Q the Winged Serpent and Stuff Bang wrote a batshit insane Doctor Strange draft for Marvel uh, back in 86. Um, also, Bob Gale, I read his drafts. Uh, he, uh, Bob Gale, who wrote Back to the Future, probably one of the most perfect films ever, ever written. Um, it, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Stan Lee did a draft, uh, in 87. Uh, yeah, I've read a whole, whole huge stack of Dr. Strange scripts. Uh, so I, yes, 
So going back to your original question, oh yes, I have seen the delightful 1978 made-for-television Doctor Strange in all its psychedelic <laughs> batshit glory. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Uh, it's, so... a, it's, a, it's a weird one. But it's not the worst Doctor Strange thing ever made, either. Like, I mean, it's... What happened with Dr. Mordred is, is a travesty. Jeffrey Combs playing... Dr. Anton Mordred. Um, and uh, they had already written the script. They had the rights to make a Doctor Strange movie. Um, and then they lost the rights. They couldn't get it, get it off the ground fast enough. But they'd already started working on sets. They'd already hired people. Money went into it. And Charles Band's like, I am not wasting this money. We're going to change the name and cut stuff out. So they had to cut out everything that was proprietary to Marvel. So what they ended up with is a 75-minute police procedural starring Dr. Anton Mordred um, as he fights this guy from the dark dimension. And it is uh, it is a goofy mess of a movie that's even that manages to be even worse than the 78, um, although it does end with a beautiful stop-motion dinosaur bone fight where dinosaur fossils fight each other as a T-Rex skeleton fights a Triceratops skeleton as they're being controlled by magic. And, uh, and that is glorious. So if you start drinking beer at the beginning of this movie and you get nice and good and hammered for the last 15 minutes, that is some great movie-watching experiences right there. So are you... Okay, for any future Doctor Strange stuff, are you guys still part of the writing team or is, is somebody else writing for Doctor Strange? Uh, as of right now, uh, they're... I don't know, uh, and and I don't think anybody really knows, um, because uh, Doctor Strange is so far down the road. Um, if you keep in mind that you know, everybody knows that uh, the you know various actors get signed to you know multi movie deals, uh, but the way those deals are set up is they can't be you know just bam 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 bam. They right. can't sign to five movies, and then you work for a year and a half making five movies. Right. Uh, they're spread out. Right, and so they have Doctor Strange is in Thor Ragnarok, as we know, and then Doctor Strange is Infinity War one and Infinity War two, whatever they decide to call it, um, and um, that's that's got him locked down for three years before he can start shooting, um, even begin shooting a Doctor Strange. So uh, they just started shooting Infinity War two, whatever that is called, um, and then they've got time after that. And then they've got the schedule that's already filled up with all these other movies that, you know, they've got Captain Marvel coming out. They've got um, uh, Black Panther coming out. They've got Homecoming 2 that they're in development on. And Marvel only puts out two movies a year, um, three with the Sony Spider-Man movies. Um, and so there, there's just no room in the schedule for a strange right now, which is why at, at least one of the reasons we haven't been contacted. So, uh, nobody's talked to me yet about doing another one. I would love to do another one, and I certainly hope they give me a call because I'll work with Marvel whenever on whatever. Um, but uh, uh, but as of right now, they I don't even think they've slotted in the future schedule exactly where he goes. So we'll see. Uh, are there any other particular script screenplays you're planning to write or any ideas you want to throw around to make? Oh God. Yeah. No, I'm working on lots of stuff at the moment. I've got a movie that we're a script that I wrote about Ted Bundy that we're looking to shoot next year. Uh, that's currently called no man of God. It's about the last week of Ted Bundy's life. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's not about the murders at all. It's all about the relationship that he forged with the FBI agent. Um, uh, uh, Bill Hagmeyer and uh, uh, all the crazy things that Ted Bundy did to try to get out of uh, the electric chair. Uh, so uh, we're going to hopefully shoot that next year. We've got, um, uh, I've got uh, another script that's bouncing around uh, that's Joel McHale is attached to called Killer of Demons based on the comic by Christopher Yost. Uh, I'm working on a, uh, a uh, just a horror project based on a short story that's going to appear in my short story collection next year. Um, so I'm working on that in my free time and uh, me and Scott have been hired to do a thing. So that I'm not allowed to talk about. So I've actually got a lot of that going on. 
uh, and also in uh, a week and a half from now, I've got to, no, no, a week from now. Damn, it is. It's only a week away. I have a new book coming out, Sea of Rust, uh, which is a novel of post-apocalyptic robot western that I wrote. So um, I've got a lot of a lot of stuff going on right now um, that uh, uh, will hopefully uh, will hopefully all come together. These one busy person damn uh so let's get into your novels actually let's talk about your novel writing actually great timing because this is actually great timing because it is coming out in a week so could you explain your new book that's coming out next week well yeah. it's essentially it's set 30 years after um the robots completely wipe us out uh it's a uh um it's a post-apocalyptic story but it's it's, you know, we've seen stories where humanity fights, you know, the robot uprising. Um, and sometimes they win and sometimes they don't, but there's always humans left. And I wanted to tell a story in which there were no humans left. Like, it's just the robots left behind. And now they've got issues with each other. And so now it's the, the robots fighting with one another and how the robot society functions after we're gone. Uh, and they don't have a purpose anymore uh, but to exist. And then... When you have these artificial intelligences that no longer have a purpose wandering around, what is your purpose? And so it's all about a robot who's wandering the wasteland trying to survive, but also trying to figure out why she's still trying to survive. Uh, and it's called Sea of Rust. Huh. Huh. That's very interesting. I might actually pick that up. I hope so. There's also lots of robot pew pew going on, so... <laughs> It is not just an existential wandering through the wasteland. There's lots of robots beating the shit out of each other. Which, because why wouldn't you? Like, that's why you write about robots, is to watch robots fight. And so, yeah, it's a 400-page uh, robot fighting existential robot western. So, it, so it's your th third novel? Third one? Yeah. It's my, yep, it's my third novel. Uh, I made three movies and uh, have published three books now. So, um... So, uh, in fact, that's the odd thing is I've actually had a project come out every year. So I put out one thing a year every year. I had Sinister in 2012, and then Dreams and Shadows in 13, Queen of the Dark Things in 14, Sinister 2 in 15, Doctor Strange in 16, and now Sea of Rust in 17. And then next year, I have another book coming out, a short story collection um, called We Are Where the Nightmares Go. Okay. Uh, which is just a collection of 10 stories that I've written over the past few years that I was like, Hey, let me put those together. And, and there we have it. That's, that's pretty darn cool. Actually. Now let's get into probably the meat of it. Like, I feel like we covered your career thus far, but let me talk about, let's talk about your podcast, junk food cinema. How did that go about? Uh, that was really like, okay. So I, I left, uh, the film critic world deliberately. Um, it wasn't just because I, uh, um, uh, I sold a movie. It was, I wanted to leave. Um, around 2007, I started realizing the problems that were going on in the, in, in the way film critique was evolving, you know, rotten tomatoes had just showed up and we, ha we started this thing that I like to refer to as play journalism, which is the art of, finding an article that someone else wrote, copy and pasting most of that, and then adding a few extra thoughts into it, or just rewriting someone else's article without really adding anything substantive to it, without doing any journalism of, of your own. And, um, uh, and I saw that that was going to choke out all the outlets that were big at the time, you know, because we had five really big outlets and then some new outlets that showed up, but they were essentially generating most of their content from other people's content um, and then with Rotten Tomatoes starting to send everybody in different directions, um, mostly consolidated there and creating a place that, hey, just come here and you can see what people think of a movie. Why go and read three reviews, four reviews of a film when you could just look at a, a number and that'll tell you if it's any good or not. And, and I was like, this is it. Like, there's not going to be any jobs left. Like, people aren't going to be able to make a living doing this. And then with YouTube showing up in 2005 um, and watching kind of uh, the YouTube culture start, start to evolve, I'm like, this is a whole different forum. This is a whole different outlet. This is going to steal away a lot of the people 
that are reading only because it's the only choice of what to do online. There's a lot of people that are going to want to watch movie reviews and listen to movie reviews. And, um, and I was like, there's not going to be like, maybe there'll be a place for me, but I doubt it. Um, there's too many really talented people in this field and a lot of them are going to lose their jobs and I don't want to deal with that. I'm, I'm out. That's why I started writing my first book. I wrote the book before I wrote Sinister. Uh, Dreams and Shadows was going to be my golden parachute and get me out and get me into the world that I had always wanted to be in, which was fiction writing. And um, so so I, I Sinister managed to do that for me. And Sinister got me an agent that got Dreams and Shadows sold, which got me, you know, uh, also sold Queen of the Dark Things. Um, and my career started and so I was able to finally, you know, take off and leave. Um, but I've always been a film critic. I've always loved film. I always loved talking about film and I missed it. And I particularly missed getting to talk about old vintage stuff, you know, stuff that had gone, fallen by the wayside, stuff that nobody cared about. And one night me and Brian Salisbury are sitting around my living room, having a couple beers and we just started talking about some of these movies, and I mentioned Battle Truck. And he's like, what the fuck is Battle Truck? And I'm like, dude, Battle Truck, man. It's a 1981 cool film where this, you know, uh, 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 with Michael Beck, where he battles a post-apocalyptic battle truck. It's exactly what you think it is. It's great. Um, and it's just a fun movie. It's shot by the director of, of uh, the, by the DP of Empire Strikes Back. It was a cool little movie from this this era when post apocalyptic films were were getting greenlit, and he's like, "Man, I need to see that movie." I'm like, "Yeah." And we started talking about a couple other movies, and while we were doing it, he started talking about this old column he used to he used to have on on Film School Rejects, which is called Junk Food Cinema, where he would pick out an old classic, uh, you know, uh, B movie, and he would pair it up with um, a junk food that he felt was appropriate. And he's like, I wanted to restart that. I want to restart that as a podcast. And I'm like, where you just talk about old B movies and you don't have to review anything new or recent. He goes, yeah, I just want to talk about cool old stuff. I'm like, man, that's what I want to do. And he's like, well, do you want to do it? And I was like, fuck it. Yeah, let's try it out and see how it happens. And that was three and a half years ago. Um, and so we've been uh, we've been uh, making episodes ever since uh, with only taking a kind of a three, three and a half month hiatus while I was away making Doctor Strange. We tried to do it over the internet. It just didn't work. Um, so uh, uh, we have this small little hole uh, in uh, uh, the winter of uh, 2015 slash early 2016. But then we've been pretty solid ever since. Um, but yeah, that's that's how it started, and that's where it, it got off to. And and uh, we just recently got picked up by Blog Talk Radio, and we've become one of their featured podcasts, and uh, has been doing real well, and people are digging it. So we're gonna keep doing it. That's yeah, because I've started just listening to it recently because I've been trying to check out other podcasts because I started a podcast on my channel in particular, and I've been doing that for oh god four going on five years now so i wanted to check out other podcasts and i come, came across drunk food cinema and i was like holy crap this is amazing i fucking love this so much and i kept on listening and listening more oh man it's such so when it comes to 80s movies because this is oh my god i want to talk 80s movies with you so bad so here <laughs> we go what this is gonna be difficult what is the most like perfect 80s movie like that came out there in that decade. What was the like, the writing, the directing? What was the perfect '80s movie that came out? Ghostbusters. Really? Yeah, I think uh, everybody. A lot of people say say it's Back to the Future. I love Back to the Future. Uh, I think Ghostbusters is much more of an '80s movie than Back to the Future is. Back to the Future is a great timeless movie. It's fantastic, but nothing so encapsulates the '80s and the mid '80s as Ghostbusters. Because it's such a weird, crazy idea that could not happen in any other era. Like, there's just no other era where, you know, a couple of scientists go off and create their own, you know, business hunting down ghosts, which happens right before, you know, this what, you know, an evil entity tries to bridge itself over into our universe. Like, that is just, and to do it as a comedy, um, 
is something that it just so encapsulates everything that was right about that era and everything about that movie is perfect. The casting, the writing, um, you know, the cinematography, everything, the, the score, the music, everything about that movie is perfect. Um, there's nothing you have to excuse. You can sit a 10 year old down with Ghostbusters and they won't ever say, why are you showing me this old movie? They'll just start laughing from the beginning. Um, it is just, it is a perfect movie. I am one of those people that would, I mean, for me, you know, I don't think of like in the eighties, I'm just thinking like overall, just like, you know, I would be the people that say back to the future. Like, that's my all-time favorite movie of all fucking time. Like, that's the movie that got me into 80s movies in the first place. Like, that DeLorean and that, like, chemistry between Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd, that just got me going. And that's how I got into 80s movies throughout till now. It, nope. is, it is a more than acceptable answer. Like, it is a very, yeah, that, that, that it's not a very, it's not a bold choice. It is, it is one of the best, you know, movies of that era, if not one of the best movies ever made. Um, so I definitely don't disagree with that. I, I kind of think that's the, the Casablanca of the eighties. Like that's that movie that's going to be watched 50 years from now and still people are going to love it. But I think that about Ghostbusters as well. Yeah. I think Ghostbusters is, is the best comedy of the era. But for me, that's just, it's just so indicative of what, what that era is because it just, where else is, where else are those movies going to really exist? But I still I see that somebody can make something like uh, um, come up with a crazy idea like Back to the Future today, and people would be like, "Yes." But something like Ghostbusters, they're like, "Wait, I don't understand." Like the Howard Howard Ghost's funny. Like I don't get it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that, that that I can understand. Yeah, for sure. Two of the best '80s movies ever made. Like if those are, you know, in fact, I would. Uh, you know, the other the other option that's in there, the one that we might get punched in the nose by people for not mentioning, the other truly perfect '80s movie, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, is just such a perfect fucking movie. So, um, are you crying? <laughs> no, you're gonna happened? you're gonna hate me so much by saying this. I have, oh, do you not? I have not. not like yours? I have not seen any Indiana Jones films. Oh, oh, you need to, you need I, to correct that immediately. I know, I know, if, I fucking know. There are my too much love, list. If you love 80s movies and you haven't watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, you have not lived. That is, it is another perfect movie. It is, it has been uh, often, uh, uh, often uh, uh, stolen from, never duplicated. It is, uh, uh, often imitated, never duplicated. There it is. Uh, it is. It is just. It's. It is perfect. It is as perfect as. If Back to the Future is your favorite movie, you might have a new contender. Um, yeah. It's I, so good. I know. It's just. I've been just putting it off, putting it off. It is just. I've never seen all the three. I'm not watching the fourth because I don't know the fourth. Just. But. Uh, uh, I mean, it's I. It's got its moments. Like people hate it, but there's some. There's some legitimate moment. Once you start. Once you start mainlining it, you're gonna want more Indiana Jones. Like that's why we all got excited for the fourth one. It's why people are still getting excited for a fifth one. Um, yeah. Because he's just. He's. He was our hero of the '80s. Like he was just. He was great. I, I can understand that because I've seen clips and I've seen that shit. But I, you know, it's odd because I've seen the knockoff, which is uh, Alec Quartermain. Oh yeah, well no you you've seen Never Too Young to Die for fuck's sake. I know. I seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like there is that is there is something very wrong with that, and that needs to be that that needs to be nipped in the bud right away, I, my friend. I, I plan to. I plan to. Like I have seen canon films. Like I've seen like King Sol uh, King Solomon's Mines, and then the sequel, the uh, Alec Cormier Lost City of Gold, and that just <laughs> such shit. I mean, Canon Films. I love Canon Films. I, during the eighties, Canon Films was just a, a contender for like grade A, like schlock movies with their action films and all that stuff, like American Ninja, and then like all the Chuck Norris films. I think Delta Force and all that stuff, and then like it's just oh my all god, all the Charles Bronson films. Yes, they, you know. Yes, Charles Bronson for crying out loud. Yes, Charles Bronson's like, oh, it's just to, to die for. Like, oh, uh, I mean, 
so what okay let me go to let's just let's just dig the, the bottom of the barrel what is the worst like the worst you have ever seen like i know you probably like get a chuckle up out of the worst of the 80s but just like what is the worst you ever seen worst 80s movie i've ever seen or worst movie i've ever seen you know you know let's just dig deep like let's do in general like what's the worst you've seen the that's... worst movie I've ever seen that was theatrically distributed is a movie called uh, After Last Season, um, which if you ever watch the trailer for it, you won't believe it's a real film. Like, it looks so inept um, like, that it looks like some 10-year-old shot their own movie um, on video and popped it onto YouTube and managed to get their neighbors to star in it. Like, you wouldn't believe this is a real movie made by adults but it was on 35 millimeter prints and was shown in four theaters across the country. And it is so unspeakably awful. Uh, so unmitigated, uh, unmitigatedly um, uh, inept that it is, it's just not a real movie. Like nothing, nothing is worse than after last season. Uh, you just, it, there's just absolutely nothing competent about it. They have a scene where they are putting someone through an MRI machine and they don't have an MRI machine, so they built one out of cardboard and then stuck printer paper to it to make it look white <laughs> so that it looks like an MRI machine. Like, this is... They claim the movie was made for $5 million. I do not believe a fucking word of it. Um, they maybe spent $495... Uh, or $4,995,000 on cocaine and hookers, and then maybe $5,000 on this film, Tops. Uh, tops. But no, this movie is like it's it's garbage. It's it's hot garbage, and there's nothing terrible that came out of the '80s as inept as After Last Season. Oh jeez. Oh god. Uh, I mean, I've seen some crap during the '80s. I mean, there's, and then recently too, I've seen some crap as well. I mean, this, but it's sometimes it's enjoyable to watch crap because you just laugh at it sometimes. But it's so like, why is this being made? Why is this even released in theaters? Why was it even released in the first place? It's laughable. Um, yeah, no, there's, yeah, that's the thing is that you've got two types of bad movies. You've got movies that aren't successful at doing what it's trying to do, and then movies that are boring. Um, and the worst crime any film can commit is being boring. There's plenty of bad movies that I love. Like, we were just talking about one, and we were talking about it before we got on the air when we talked about uh, Never Too Young to Die. Like, Never Too Young to Die is a terrible movie that is never for a second boring. Like, it is always doing something so batshit crazy or over the top that you're like, what the fuck am I watching? Why is George Lazenby here? I don't understand. Uh, you know, why Why is, is Gene Simmons playing a hermaphroditic transvestite? Like, I don't... I don't know what I'm watching, but I love it. Why are post-apocalyptic guys in dune buggies showing up to fight John Stamos? This doesn't make any sense, but I can't stop watching it. Like, that is great, and that's a lot of fun. Like, that is that is a good, terrible movie. And then you just have, there are, especially in the 80s, there are a lot of those movies that are just criminally boring, where you just, you're like, oh my God, why did anybody think this was going to entertain somebody? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, what was what is a recent good, but also somewhat perfect with all with writing and directing and all that stuff. Oh, a recent perfect movie. Yeah. Like, uh, I would argue Winter Soldier. Um, uh, I think Winter Soldier is a perfect film. It it definitely has the best first act of any film that I've seen. Um, in probably a decade, uh, just how lean it is, uh, how well it develops its characters and sets up its friendship. It does things we've never seen before, like having two spies on a mission together, and while they're clearing out a boat of, of terrorists slash pirates, whatever, whatever we're going to call them, um, they're having a discussion about who Captain America should be dating. And it's just, they're, we're building these bonds and these characters. It's just such an entertaining uh, perfect movie. Um, I another one I think recently, um, Ex Machina, um, is a a brilliant film that I think is one of those uh, best movies of this decade. Uh, that it's just 
perfect in every little thing that it does. Uh, it's just so good. Um, uh, this year, uh, Baby Driver. Uh, I feel Baby Driver hits every mark that Edgar was aiming for um, and does so in such an entertaining way. I just absolutely love it. I don't, I don't have a, there's not a flaw with that movie. Not everybody's in love with it, but I think the big argument is the movie's not as great as everybody says it is. And everyone else going, yes, it is. Um, it's, there's not really a lot of voices going, this is bad um, that anybody takes seriously. Uh, so I, I feel like that's definitely one as well. So, for first-time listeners of Junk Food Cinema, what episode would you recommend listening? Oh, that's a good question. You know, one uh, that people have really enjoyed, one that I think, one that I think really illustrates what we do, um, is our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle episode. Um, that turned a lot of people on because uh, we covered the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie, and we take it seriously, and we talk about you know, how, you know, the cinematography of it and, and how they use it to hide the practical effects and how to make the practical effects work and talk about the story and what works and what doesn't. And there were a lot of folks that were really surprised that, you know, you had film critics taking a movie that people have relegated to being a kitschy kids film and treating it with the same seriousness that you would treat a Kurosawa movie. Um, and I, I think that's very much what we do. Um, I think one of the things, or if you want to, what I would recommend is sift through our list of titles and try to find one of your favorite movies or a movie that you really love that you didn't know other people love and listen to that episode. And if you dig our vibe talking about the type of movie that you already love, then start listening to the other ones like that. And then try to listen to the ones that, uh, of movies you haven't heard of so that we can hopefully turn you on to something that you didn't know existed. Because uh, that's really the whole point of the podcast. We do episodes with really common, well-known movies uh, because it helps kind of hook people in or, or help identify taste. And then we do episodes that we're really passionate about. Like, here's a movie you need to watch uh, that needs to be in your life right now. Um, uh, which is, I mean, part of what we're doing like this summer. We're doing the summer of 87 where we're just talking about uh, the best movies, our favorite movies that came out in the summer of 87, which is a great summer. Uh, we're definitely not doing summer of 89, probably not doing summer of 88, uh, because those summers really kind of sucked. 89 is like the worst summer in history. Um, but 88 is also not so great. Um, but 87 was just so good. It's like, let's do an entire summer on it. But yeah, we've definitely got some episodes coming up that I'm really excited about because they're movies nobody talks about ever. Um, that you just don't hear referenced, uh, but that are great, and that I hope to introduce a whole new generation of film goers to, where they're like, I didn't know there that this movie existed. Uh, I gotta see this, and then discover the the joy of this forgotten beautiful relic. Yeah, that's kind of the beauty of it. I mean, I, I and my crew just did a uh, 1987 film episode, so we talked about films from '87 as well. And we we just talked about like select a few of them as we do on the podcast. We talked about uh, we talked about Hellraiser. We talked yeah. we talked about uh, one of our co-hosts talked about Billy Hills Cop Two, which is a yeah. great, great sequel. Uh, one of our co-hosts brought up the Peter Jackson uh, classic Bad Taste, <laughs> and then I actually classic. <laughs> classic. I mean, I mean, a lot of people just like. Oh, it's a weird movie. But then I brought up uh, Miami Connection. Yeah, which only played in a few theaters. Yeah, only. Uh, yeah. Regional release. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons we've avoided Miami Connection this summer was because it's like, it didn't really play. That wasn't really part of the landscape of the summer of 87. We'll definitely do an episode on Miami Connection eventually. But it's, uh, you know, considering some of the other movies that came out that summer, considering like The Gate came out that summer oh, um, yeah. okay. uh, uh, Lost Boys freaking Lost Boys came oh, yeah. out of these. Yeah. Robocop um, uh, and, and, you know some of our canon favorites like Over the Top and uh, yep. American Ninja 2 um, so much uh, American Ninja 2 The Confrontation um, it's uh, yeah it, it was such a great summer filled with so many entertaining geeky movies 
um, unlike any other summer. Like, 86 was a really packed summer, but not nearly as packed as 87 was. 87 is kind of like, now, it's, it's, it, it is the most packed summer. The best summer still remains summer of 82. Summer of 82 is the best summer ever. Yeah. Um, every weekend, there's a classic. Like, oh, it's yeah. Un- it's like, yeah, this weekend is E.T., and next weekend is The Thing, and the weekend after that is Rocky Three, and, and it's just like, what the fuck is happening? Oh, my God. Yeah, here's Conan the Barbarian, and here's uh, Rats, uh, Secret of Nim, and uh, uh, here's the Dark Crystal, and it's like, what is going on here? This summer is unreal. Um, yeah, it's that is the best summer of all time, hands down. Have you guys covered Blade Runner yet? No, we haven't. Blade Runner's on a list of movies we're definitely going to cover at some point. Are you excited uh, for the sequel that's coming out next couple of months? Blade Runner 2049? Yeah. Um, there's, I, I very rarely get excited, like, excited about movies coming out anymore because I find that if I temper my expectations, I have a much better time. That's true. Uh, if, if I get, if allow myself to get too hyped anymore, I end up not... Um, uh, not enjoying it as much, but there, uh, there's some movies I just can't help it. Like I watched those trailers of Thor Ragnarok, and I'm like, oh my god, Thor Ragnarok! Holy shit, motherfucker! This is gonna be the best movie ever! And, um, and I can't help but be hyped. You no, know? I'm just so fucking hyped to see that movie. And it's gonna be weird because I'm gonna watch Ben doing dialogue that we didn't write, and that's gonna be a surreal experience for me watching him as Doctor Strange doing that. Uh, and yet, I don't care. That's not why I'm excited to see that movie. I'm excited to watch fucking Thor and Loki fuck some shit up. Um, that score, the scores that they're using for the, the the trailers sound so great. I love the whole '80s aesthetic that Taika Waititi is taking into this. Oh, yeah. Like the, that poster is like the greatest video game never made. Um, there's everything that Taika was Waititi has done with that movie. I cannot fucking wait for, and so I'm. That's the movie I'm super hyped for. Um, Blade Runner 2049. Looking forward to it. I'm like, yeah, was, I'm gonna see that opening weekend. But at the same time, we've had some. We've had a couple of movies this year that are based on classic franchises. That everybody's like, oh my god, we've got a new Alien movie coming out by Ridley Scott. How great is that? And it's like, oh, it's Alien coming. Um, and so. I'm tempering my expectations. I am hopeful that that movie will be great. Yeah. Uh, I would much like that movie to be great. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. I'm, you know, also the other one I'm I'm super excited for is uh, the new Star Wars movie. Of uh, course, of course. It's well, I, I'm normally not hyped about Star Wars movies. Like I have not uh, I have not enjoyed the last two very much at all. Ooh. Uh, but uh, uh, I absolutely fucking fucking. Just adore Ryan Johnson. I love all of his movies. He's an amazing human being, and I will watch him direct an episode of Paint Drying. You're goddamn right, Looper. Looper's fucking phenomenal. Um, uh, opened up at the same time as Sinister, and uh, opened up the same weekend uh, in the UK. And so me and Ryan had a uh, a a thing back and forth where. Ryan was just like, your movie's going to do better than my movie. And I'm like, no, fuck you. Looper's going to do better than my movie. And he's like, no, 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 you're wrong. Sinister, Sinister's definitely going to do better. I'm like, no, Looper. And that was like our argument was your movie's cooler than my movie. Um, because Ryan Johnson is an amazing human being. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I cannot wait to see what he did with Star Wars. Uh, and I know that no matter how I felt about the recent Star Wars movies, Ryan's is going to kick fucking ass. So I am 100% down for that. Like, that's that's what I'm hyped for right now is Ryan's movie and uh, Ryan's little Star Wars movie um, and um, uh, and uh, Ragnarok. Like, that's my fall. Oh, man, that's going to be great. That's going to be awesome. Oh, oh man, okay. So let's just, I just want to dig deeper because, God, um, what actor do you like? Like, what was the actor did, that you loved the most in the 80s like what movies that the actor made in the 80s was like the favorites of yours um huh who's my favorite actor of the 80s that's a tough one I mean um oh that's I would probably say of the 80s probably it's gonna be Mel Gibson 
or it's going to be because you got you got Road Warrior, you've got Lethal Weapon one and two, um, you've got a bunch of the other just oddball movies that he did during that period of time uh, that are just because le- between Lethal Weapon and Road Warrior, those are two of the best movies of the eighties. Like those movies are fucking great. Um, so you know those are those are definitely like he's up there. Um, uh, I would, uh, you know, I liked Stallone a lot, uh, and I do like several of his movies. Kurt Russell might actually be between him and Mel Gibson. It might come down to Kurt Russell. Uh, Kurt Russell, of course, you know, Escape from New York, uh, The Thing, um, uh, Tango and Cash. Um, you know, from beginning to end, he was doing fun stuff. Uh, Overboard which definitely holds up and is really funny. Um, he, he's just fantastic. Uh, I would definitely put him up there. Uh, my oddball choice might be um, uh, Michael Beck, uh, who uh. only made five films, uh, but of them, several of them are just some of my deep fried favorites. You're talking uh, wa- The Warriors, uh, Battle Truck, uh, Megaforce, which is just one of my deep fried guilty pleasures. Um, uh, and then you've got Xanadu, which is just batshit insane. Uh, and so much fun. And that, uh, that ELO soundtrack is just amazing. Um, uh, so he'd be like that oddball choice of like, well, four movies that I absolutely ridiculously loved and watched way too many fucking times. All star Michael Beck. So maybe Michael Beck, he, he, you know, he, he, eases out Mel Gibson or uh, uh, Kurt Russell, uh, but probably not because he, he's, he literally is in a window from 1979 to 1982 where he was in movies, and then pff, that was it. Um, he just was all TV after that. Um, uh, he's like the, the perfect example of the guy who was given the shot and then just whiffed it. And just never caught on, and he'll, he talks about that. Um, so, but yeah, those are, those are probably, probably some of my favorite guys of the eighties in terms of like the bat, but at the same time, you know, I would also put Sigourney cause you asked, uh, actor, I would also put Sigourney Weaver up there. Actress. Uh, yeah, right. Um, I was going to ask the actress too, cause there's I mean, you go a lot of aliens, actresses. Which is 79, but then you go aliens, mm-hmm. you've got her in aliens, you've got her in, uh, uh, Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. uh, and then she did a bunch of other work throughout the, the decade that just was phenomenal. So I Sigourney Weaver's probably, I don't know that I'm going to find another actress that I like as much as Sigourney Weaver. That's um, true, actually. That's just, very true. That's very true. Oh, but man. You got other people, Nancy Allen did a lot of great work then. Um, uh, 80s All Over just did a great interview with her. Um, by the way, are you listening to 80s All Over? I've... Ooh. I have heard of them. I've yet to hear an episode from them. I know they're they're going through like each month of a year. So I I mean it depends on the month, of the year, and what the episode is. I might listen to it, but I'm just start from the seriously start from the beginning. It is it is the greatest podcast going right now. I absolutely am addicted to it. They literally go month by month and review every major release, and you hear about the most bizarre oddball '80s movies that you never knew existed. And then you get to see these running themes of which actors were big during these years and why they became who they were. Like we just, we hit, there was a patch during late 1980 to early 1981 where Charles Grodin showed up like almost every month. Like Charles Grodin just constantly had movies out. You you see why people still mention Charles Grodin because for a year of their lives, Charles Grodin was seemingly in fucking everything. Um, but yeah, it is a it's a really fascinating podcast, and if you become a patron, they do special episodes where they interview actors and writers uh, and directors from that era to talk about their work specifically in the '80s and what it was like in '80s Hollywood. So I this is definitely um, uh, 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 very much uh, relevant to your interests. That's that's yeah. Like I was always wanted to listen to the episode, I just never got around to it. I'm very busy otherwise, but yeah, it's just. Um, I just love Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger, our Schwarzenegger in the eighties was just big. Oh my god, yeah. so so big. Like, like a lot of people, like I've seen like 
not like hate, but like don't a lot of people don't mention Commando. Like Commando is like one of my favorites of Schwarzenegger. The Running Man that was also eighty seven. That is a great movie. I mean, I'm kind of kind of interested in reading the book based on Stephen King and see if that compares. I, I heard this it's, it's loosely based on the novel. Yeah, very loosely based, but I'm kind of curious how that compares. Um, Predator, fucking Predator from eighty seven. That is a big thing, and it's coming coming back next year. The Predator with Shane Black again. It, it, I'm so excited for that shit. Um, have you guys seen No Retreat, No Surrender? Uh, yes, yes, I have. Uh, I I saw it when it came out. I have not. We have. I don't think we we haven't covered it on our show. Um, but yeah, I saw that back back in the day. Oh man, oh man, Jean Claude Van Damme's first screen appearance like debut movie like oh my gosh it is ridiculous he's actually didn't he appear in a movie as a dancer before that where he was actually just dancing in the background it's he he, he has some uncredited roles like before that but like this is like his true like starring role like like not like starring but just like a co-starring role as like ivan the russian like he's the main baddie you know, you see him at the beginning, and then you see him at the end, kind of in the middle. But it's like it's just, uh, I love Jean Claude Van Damme, mind you. Like he is like one of the top. Like he's very underrated when it comes to action stars. Like he is like, oh my gosh, I love him so much. Yeah, the thing is, is I love Schwarzenegger and I love JCVD. Um, but the thing is, is that when you rewatch their movies, so many of them don't hold up. Whereas some of these other actors that I mentioned, those movies do hold up. Like you can watch the, you can watch Road Warrior thirty years later and be like, well, actually now, like thirty five years later, and be like, this movie's perfect. But then you watch Cyborg and you're like, this movie's ass. This movie doesn't make any goddamn sense. Um, so, uh, uh, so it becomes becomes a little hard to like rank them up there in in my my tops. Because yeah, like Commando, Commando's a lot of fun, but Commando's not a good movie. Commando's a great movie, right? That, that has a lot of silliness to it, right? But I I do adore it. But then you look at stuff like Raw Deal, which has some issues to it and is a little yeah, slow. Like it's that's crazy true. and fun, but it's not as good, right? Uh, and yeah, he's got a, he's got a couple clunkers in there. That's true, actually. Like Raw Deal didn't like really sell me per se, but. Like, everything in between was fine. I mean, and Cyborg. <laughs> God damn Cyborg. Like, they God had. Damn Cyborg, man. It's just like they'd use, like, the. Because they wanted to make He Man the Masters of the Universe 2, and they used those sets for Cyborg. And just, like, that's just, like. God damn canon. Like, the canon. Just, like, glorious canon. <laughs> I did ask what was the worst of recent years i guess so what was the worst of the 80s like it was the worst movies of the 80s oh you know i don't even i can't even it's so hard because there's so many terrible movies that just came and went um uh that have never been reissued like that's one of the weird things about listening to 80s all over is that you really do you're like oh this is the worst movie uh to come out in the 80s and then uh you listen to these guys uh, Drew and, and Scott talk about um, this weird Canadian tax shelter movie that came out in 1981 has never been put out on VHS. Um, it's so it's so very hard to figure that out. Um, and then there's movies that are just terrible that I love anyway that would definitely be on the list. Like Xanadu's probably on the list for worst movies of the 80s. It helped kick off the 80s. Uh, but dear God, is it not good. Um, I just kind of love it for the insanity of it because I grew up with it and I, that music has, you know, a lot of nostalgic value to me, but I would never say, Oh dude, you need to check out Xanadu. That movie's great. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's just, uh, so many, you know, one of the worst movies I've ever seen is, uh, speaking of, you know, cyborg, Albert Pugh the director, he directed a captain America movie. Um, uh, in 1980 that came out in 89 and it is fucking unwatchable his direct it's the movie's bad enough his director's cut is unrepentantly awful like we ended up seeing uh, a 35 millimeter screening of it here in austin 
and we were just awestruck at how incompetent and poorly put together it was. And I would argue that might be one of the worst movies of the 80s. Uh, and even then, there's people who are like, ah, no, let me pull out. It's like, uh, and at this point, I'm talking about theatrically distributed movies. Right, uh, of course. Where, where, right. I mean, even like Miami Connection was theatrically distributed, but it was regional. It only played in a small region. It never That's escaped the, the Florida, you know, southern area. Um, but you get um, uh, you get some of these movies that you know did get wide distribution, and there's just some garbage in there. I, I think, in fact, you know what I would say. Uh, Night Train to Terror might be the very worst movie put out in the 80s. Night Train to Terror is terrible. It is, you want to talk about unwatchable movies. It is a movie in which what they did was they took three unreleasable, unwatchable movies and they cut them down to about 20, 25 minutes a piece like edited them down to just turn them into short stories. These were full length theatrical films edited down and then put in this wraparound story where the devil and God are sitting on a train and the train is going to be derailed at a certain time. And everyone on the train is doomed. Um, and the devil and God are telling stories to one another, which are these terrible movies. And in one of the cars, they have a band playing, but they're only playing one song and if I'm correct, there's nine minutes of footage of them playing that one song in this entire movie. It is garbage. It is nothing is good about it. And apparently, if you get the DVD release of it, it actually has the full theatrical, uh, the full length, uh, feature length version of one of those stories. And that watching it feature length, it makes more sense and is slightly more endurable than the chopped down version. Um, but is still not particularly good. Uh, but yeah, Night Train to Terror. I thought about showing it for my birthday last year um, just to torment my friends. Uh, 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 Tim League of the Alamo Draft House um, lends me a theater every year for my birthday, and I show um, crazy movies from the uh, American Genre Film Archive. Um, and I've shown some of my favorite crazy 80s movies that way. I showed Trick or Treat, uh, the 86 film. I showed Creepers, the uh, American cut of the Argento film Phenomena. Um, uh, uh, I, I showed uh, a movie called Sorceress, which is another one of those possible great worst movies ever made. Uh, Roger Corman film from uh, 82, I, I think. Um, uh, I've shown uh, Can't Stop the Music. Uh, the uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Village People movie. Uh, <laughs> hell, yeah, I did. I showed Skate Town USA, the very first appearance of uh, uh, on screen appearance of Patrick Swayze. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I showed Star Wars, uh, a 1981 repertory print of Star Wars one year. That was a lot of fun. I, I know some people who have prints of Star Wars movies from before George Lucas fucked with them. So, uh, occasionally we get to watch those on the big screen, which is great. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so that is, um, uh, so yeah, so, uh, I've, uh, I, I almost showed Night Train to Terror last year and I thought better of it and showed Trick or Treat instead, which played like gangbusters. Uh, that movie is so much fun. Oh man. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, are there any movies that you want to cover on junk food cinema that you haven't done already? Lots way too many to even name like there's uh uh one of the things we're going to start doing is we're going to get back to doing um modern junk food masters um which is talking about people who are making films now and talk about their body of work now and why they need to be considered you know modern masters uh and we've got a couple of people that i'm very eager to talk about one that i'm really excited about i, I referenced a little earlier uh, i'm really excited to do the 1992 film Leap of Faith, uh, starring Steve Martin, uh, in which Steve Martin plays a shyster uh, revival tent uh, preacher. Uh, and it is amazing. It's such a good film. It's such a great script. His performance when he's preaching on stage as a fire and brimstone preacher full of, you know, lots of glitter and lights is glorious. And it's it's got 
Liam Neeson's in it. It's got uh, it's one of the early appearances of um, um, oh man, what is his name? Uh, died a few years back of a heroin overdose. Uh, um, was in Boogie Nights. I'm blanking on his name all of a sudden. Uh, damn it. Uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's in it. Um, you've got uh, uh, Meatloaf is in it as the bus driver. Um, it is it, and it's crazy good. So I'm really excited to talk about that movie. Um, that's one we've definitely got coming up. Uh, and there's a couple others that we're like, oh, dude, we absolutely have to do this. We got to do that. So uh, we've got just a bunch of stuff in the hopper to to talk about. We we make it in a, in our podcast. We have a joke where we it's a drinking game where. You take a drink every time we say, oh, here's a future episode. Here's a movie we have to talk about. Um, and uh, it's been the tough part about doing Summer of 87. There's been so much stuff to do, but we've been married to that. And so movies that we get excited about. There's another one I really want to do um, uh, called The the Final Terror, uh, which is a 1983 anti-slasher um, directed by the guy who'd go on to direct The Fugitive. Um, and... Uh, and it's a surprisingly good movie with a really great uh, uh, performance by a young Joe Pantoliano, uh, Joey Pants, as everyone likes to call him. Uh, so that's a movie I'm excited to talk about. There's a there's a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, one of the questions that I want to ask is, um, uh, shit, I just lost it now. Uh, you know. Oh, no. I was in my head for a second and just gone. Like, boop! Just gone out of nowhere. Uh, man, I just... Is there... Would you be interested in being on the 80s All Over podcast as a guest? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I've known both of those guys for years. Um... Drew was an editor of mine back early in the days of uh, Ain't It Cool News. Um, you know, been at tons of events with him. Scott Weinberg lived here in town for a long time um, and has been to tons of events as well. I know both of them really well and uh, enjoy their company quite a bit. It's part of the reason I love listening to their podcast is I get to kick back and listen to two of my friends talk about movies. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I would absolutely be a guest on 80s All Over at some point if they would allow me to. If they allowed them to, like that, that'd be sweet, man. Like, okay, so Chung Fu Cinema, what is the year range you guys cover? Uh, we don't have we don't have a um, uh, a limit on that. We we tend to cover um, mid to late seventies up through uh, early aughts. Tends to be where we uh, stick. But we bounce uh, around. We've done, we've done some stuff in the early '70s. We've done at least one '60s movie at some point. Um, we've got some plans to do some earlier stuff coming up soon. Um, we've uh, uh, we've done a couple of movies from just a couple of years ago. We did a, an entire month where we talked about movies that we just saw on the festival circuit over the last few years, um, uh, and got to turn some people on to some unknown stuff that's recent. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's all over the map, but really we, our sweet spot is pretty much, um, eighties to nineties and then buffering out on either side of that. Uh, cause it's really, it's the aughts are, we're finally getting to a point where we can start talking about movies from the aughts and consider them classics or junk food classics. And people go, Oh yes, that movie is a classic film. Um, we finally just reached the era where people are like, "Oh yes, The Matrix is a classic." You can talk, you can refer to The Matrix as a classic. It's not a recent movie; it's a classic film. And we can talk about movies like Reign of Fire, and people are like, "Oh God, that movie! I remember when Reign of Fire came out. That was so long ago. Holy shit! I love Reign of Fire." Or really, I never saw that movie. <clears throat> and so we can do that. But the, our sweet spot right now is the '80s and '90s. That's good. Uh, let's just wrap this up here. So where can the my fine viewers and listeners can find you everywhere else? Uh, you can find me uh, at Massaworm on Twitter. That's M-A-S-S-A-W-Y-R-M or on Instagram. Uh, and you can find my book, uh, Sea of Rust, or my previous two books, uh, Dreams of Chaz, Queen of Dark, Dark Things, wherever you buy books. You can find it at your local bookstore. Um, 
or on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever you buy books. Uh, and you can find my movies uh, um, uh, wherever you find movies. That's Sinister, Sinister 2, and, and Doctor Strange. Uh, you can find them on the various platforms. Oh, man. It was just great talking to you, man. It's just, you're just the greatest, man. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. This is a lot of fun. Oh, man. It's just, so uh, check him out. He is great. I'll leave links to his social media in the description below. Check him out. Follow him. Do everything. Chat with him. He's just a great guy. Thank you for listening and watching Cinema Talk here. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Adios, amigos. (laughs) 